tonight I want to turn to two very significant and influential individuals from the Buddhist tradition, Thich Nhat Hanh and the Dalai Lama. So Thich Nhat Hanh, Vietnamese Buddhist monk, just died last year. He was known as a peace activist, an author, a poet, and teacher. And he founded the Plum Village tradition, named after Plum Village, which is his big uh, uh, organizational center and monastery in France. Do you know what city it is? It's just outside of Paris, I think, yeah. Um, I should mention, Chris, my wife, belongs to a Buddhist Sangha that is based on Thich Nhat Hanh's teachings. So she, uh, she's both a member here and, and a member of, of that Sangha. Uh, Thich Nhat Hanh is recognized as one of the main inspirations for what is called engaged Buddhism. And I'll have more to say about that in a moment. He's also known as the father of a word you've probably heard a lot about lately, mindfulness. It became, but he was one of the first to talk about mindfulness, wrote a whole book about it. Um, and he's been a major impact on what we call Western Buddhism. What has happened is that in the modern world, as various religious traditions have intermingled, some have gone east, the, some from the east have gone west, and Buddhism, when it has come to the West, has been adapted to some degree, as it, sh as it has to be for a Western audience. Uh, the, the traditional Buddhist uh, teachings are very monastic, so you're not going to get a lot of followers here. So he's, he and a number of other main teachers have been very influential in creating what is known as Western Buddhism. He was born Yuan Wan Bao, October 11, 1926, in the ancient capital of Hue in central Vietnam. Those of you who remember the Vietnam War probably remember Hue. Major battle took place around Hue. Um, until he was five, he lived with his extended family at his grandmother's house. Uh, he recalled feeling a great sense of joy at the age of seven when he saw a drawing of the Buddha peacefully sitting on the grass, that peaceful pose. On a school trip, he visited a mountain where there was a hermit who was said to sit quietly day and night to become peaceful like the Buddha. They explored the area and he found a natural well from which he drank water and felt this deep sense of joy. So he was starting to have semi-mystical experiences as, as a young boy around the image of the Buddha. Um, and all these experiences led him to want to become a Buddhist monk. With his parents' permission, at age 16, he began training at the Tuhua Temple. And he studied there as a novice for three years received training in both Mahayana and Theravada teachings. I'm not going to go into all the different Buddhist teachings, but there are two major schools, Mahayana, Theravada. And in Vietnam, both were sort of incorporated. So he studied both of them. Uh, Dalai Lama would be much more Mahayana tradition. Uh, he also learned Chinese, English, and French. In 1950, at age 24, he took up residence at this famous pagoda in Saigon, the Ang Kuang Pagoda, where he was ordained as a monk in 1950. He supported himself by selling books, and he also attended Saigon University, where he studied science. In 1955, he returned to Hue, and served as the editor of the official publication of the General Association of Vietnamese Buddhists. So he's very much interested in literature. He's interested in science. He knows a lot of languages. He knows the Buddhist uh, teachings. So he's really prepping himself for something. He probably doesn't know what at this point. However, that publication, now this is a, that I just mentioned, was subsequently suspended by high-ranking monks who disapproved of what he was saying. 
So there's going to be, this is where the rebel, a little bit of the rebellious side will come in. He believed this was due to his opinion that Vietnam's various Buddhist organizations should unite into one. You see why that might be opposed? The various organizations, if that happens. Would, so uh, that was his, his, his reason for thinking that this, his publication was, was uh, shut down. Um, in 1956, in fact, his name was taken off the records of the Ang Huang Pagoda. Kind of a excommunication of sorts. Uh, yeah. And so they effectively disowned him at that point. Um, he subsequently caught it in a nearby high school and continued to write, promoting the idea of what he called a humanistic, unified Buddhism. He wanted Buddhism to become unified within Vietnam. And he was getting great uh, feedback that was not good. These individual groups wanted to keep their own power structure. Um, so facing further opposition from both religious and secular authorities in Vietnam, he accepted a Fulbright scholarship in 1960 to study comparative religion at Princeton Theological Seminary. And then in 1962, he was appointed a lecturer in Buddhism at Columbia University. So he knew what he was talking about. I mean, he was well-educated in Buddhist teaching, so much so that both these universities were interested in his efforts. Um, in 1963, for those of you who remember those years, <laughs> There was a military overthrow of the Ngo Dien Diem regime. Do you remember that? Diem was the regime that was ruling in South Vietnam, Catholic, Catholic. That, that uh, regime was overthrown. And uh, he returned to South Vietnam at the request of this gentleman, Thich Tri Quang, who was a monk who was protesting the religious discrimination against Buddhism from the French, who were Catholic, in a Buddhist country. <laughs> Interesting. Uh, I should mention, and I'll, I'll, uh, I'll be using this nickname from now on, his nickname was Thai, T-H-A-I, Thai. So he, he returned, um, and as a result, the General Association of Buddhists and other groups merged to form the United Buddhist Church of Vietnam. And Thai proposed that it publicly call for an end to the Vietnam War. Take a political stance. He continually advocated for peace and reconciliation, notably calling in September 1964. That was another big year, if you remember the, how things emerge. Remember what happened in 64, the Gulf of Tonkin, which really then <laughs> kicked it off. The Gulf of Tonkin incident was the claim that a U.S. destroyer was attacked by North Vietnamese boats. That turned out not to be true. But that was used for the reason to escalate. That's when massive amounts of troops started to go. Before that time, there had been U.S. troops there under Kennedy. There had been advisors, etc. 64, boom. So, uh, so he, he called for a peace settlement and actually referred to the Viet Cong as brothers, which probably wasn't the best political move because the Viet Cong, of course, were seen as the enemy. The South Vietnamese government subsequently closed down the, the Buddhist journal. So there seemed to be... A, so on May 1st, 1966, at the Thuy Hue Temple, he received what is known as the Lamp of Transmission from a Zen master, Chon Tat. This is a very high uh, accolade if when, you, when you get the, you can see but the Lamp of Transmission, when something is transmitted, some sort of spiritual authority is being handed off. So it was a very high uh, award that he was being presented. It made him a Dharmacharya, which means teacher. Acharya is teacher in Sanskrit. Dharma is the path, the way. So a dharmacharya is a teacher of the way. 
I like that, <laughs> the way. Um, and, uh, and he was also became the head of uh, a number of monasteries. So in March of 64, Thai and the monks at the Ankhwang Pagoda, he's now been <laughs> accepted back into that, founded the Institute of Higher Buddhist Studies with the support of the United Buddhist Church of Vietnam. It was renamed Van Han Buddhist University. It was a private institution in Saigon that taught Buddhist studies, Vietnamese culture, and languages. So he helped found a university. So he's very much interested in education as the key, one of the keys, not only to peace during the, the, the war, but just peace in general. Uh, he taught psycho Buddhist psychology and helped finance the university by fundraising. Okay. So he taught Buddhist psychology. Some have said Buddhism is basically psychology. It plums deeply into the nature of the psyche. Uh, that same year, he co-founded the School of Youth for Social Service. It was a neutral core of Buddhist peace workers who went into the rural areas. Now remember, there's a war going on went into the rural areas to establish schools, build health care clinics, and help rebuild villages that had been demolished. It consisted of 10,000 volunteers and social workers who aided war-torn villages to rebuild their schools and help establish medical centers. So it wasn't just up here. He's not just teaching abstractly. He's doing the work. In addition, he created what was known as the Order of Interbeing, which is uh, still around today. I think, Chris, you know two people who are members of this, right, in your group. Uh, it's a mon uh, it was a monastic and lay people coming together, um, teaching what he called the five mindfulness teachings. Remember I said he was the founder of mindfulness? before mindfulness became popular. <laughs> so we'll get to those uh, in a moment. Um, how, however, during this time, the university was taken over by one of the chancellors who wanted to sever, sever ties with his youth group, accusing them of what? what do you, if they're working in the villages to help rebuild these villages, what might they likely be accused of? Communist sympathizers. Communist sympathizers. So they, uh, uh, the university for a, a period of time was shut down. Then he published this poem which said, the, some lines in it, whoever is listening, be my witness. I cannot accept this war. He was labeled an anti-war poet and a pro-communist propagandist by both the Vietnamese and American press. So he returns to the United States in 1966 to lead a symposium in Vietnamese Buddhism at Cornell University and to continue his work for peace. He was invited by Professor George McTernan Cahen, also of Cornell, and a US government foreign policy consultant to participate in a forum on US policy in Vietnam. On June 1st, he released a five point proposal addressed to the US government, including that the US and South Vietnam cease airstrikes throughout Vietnam, and the US demonstrate a willingness to withdraw from Vietnam within a few months. This was in 1966. The South Vietnamese military government responded by accusing him of treason, said he was a communist and that he had committed treason, which means he could not go back to Vietnam. So he's, he's now a person without a country. He, isn't, he doesn't have a U.S. Uh, passport or citizenship. He, Vietnam won't let him back in. So he's, he's sort of in no man's land. He also met with two very influential people 
Anyone know this gentleman? The Trappist monk Thomas Merton, some, perhaps one of the great, greatest of modern uh, American mystics, if we can use that term. Uh, he also met with Martin Luther King Jr. and urged him to publicly denounce the war. Thus, if you remember, in 1967, King gave a speech beyond Vietnam, a time to break the silence. It was given at the Riverside Church in New York City, his first to publicly question U.S. involvement in Vietnam. Later that year, King nominated Thai for the Nobel Peace Prize. He didn't get it. But in his nomination, this is what King said. I do not personally know of anyone more worthy of the Nobel Peace Prize than this gentle monk from Vietnam. His ideas for peace, if applied, will build a monument of ecumenism to world brotherhood to humanity. King also called Thai a nonviolent apostle of peace. So he wasn't allowed to return to Vietnam, not allowed to remain in the United States. He moved to Paris, 1966, where he became the chair of the Vietnamese Buddhist peace delegation. Uh, in 1969, he established the Unified Buddhist Church in France. And in 75, he formed what were known as the Sweet Potatoes Meditation Center, southeast of Paris. For the next seven years, he focused on writing and completed the miracle of mindfulness. And also the moon bamboo the sun, my heart. In an interview, he said that the miracle of mindfulness was, quote, written for our social workers, first in Vietnam, because they were living in a situation where the danger of dying was there every day. So out of compassion and willingness to help them to continue their work, the miracle of mindfulness was written as a manual practice. And after that, many friends in the West thought it would be helpful for them. So we allowed it to be translated into English. So when the North Vietnamese Army took control of the South in 1975, Thai was denied permission to return to Vietnam, and the communist government banned his publications. <laughs> banned from one side, banned from the other. Why, would, why might they ban his publications? Well, this regime was very anti-religious, this, this, the, the regime that came in. They, they saw religion as something that would hold back uh, the development of, of the Vietnamese people. So during a trip at, uh, to Singapore, he began to lead clandestine efforts to help rescue Vietnamese boat people. Remember the Vietnamese boat people in the Gulf of Siam? When the Singapore government discovered this, his passport was impounded, and he was given 24 hours to leave the country. He was aided by the French ambassador Jacques Gasol, so he was able to go back. Then in 1982, along with Sister Chong Kong, a Buddhist nun, he established Plum Village Monastery near Bordeaux in southern France. This is the famous uh, uh, Thich Nhat Hanh Monastery, the largest Buddhist monastery in Europe and America, with over 200 monastics, so there are monks living there, and 10,000 visitors a year. You can go here for a retreat, for example, a week, two weeks. So when they say visitors, it's not like tourists just coming in and you go to retreats. Here have a couple pictures. You can see it. It's beautiful.
There he is giving his teachings. In 2005, after lengthy negotiations, the Vietnamese government allowed him a return visit. He was allowed to teach there, publish four of his books in Vietnamese, and travel the country with monastic and lay members of his order. He wasn't given residence. He was allowed to visit. Perhaps for publicity, because he's becoming pretty well known by this time. Um, However, over the following years, tensions developed with the government, and he remained at Plum Village as his permanent residence for most of the rest of his life, till right at the end. And I'll say something about that in a moment. In 2009, he addressed the World Parliament of Religions in Melbourne. Americans say Melbourne. The Australians say Melbourne, right? So he was. He addressed the world, the world Parliament of Religions, which had its first meeting in the United States in Chicago in 1890-something, something that happens every, every few years. Um, he also re, uh, addressed UNESCO in Paris, and he called for specific steps to reverse the cycle of violence that was spreading worldwide and global warming. Let's do something about global warming in 2009. In 2014, he experienced a severe brain hemorrhage and was hospitalized. Uh, in July of 2015, he flew to San Francisco to speed his recovery uh, with an aggressive rehabilitation program at UCS, uh, University of California of San Francisco Medical Center. Uh, he returned to France in January of 2016, continued to see specialists, but was unable to verbally communicate for the remainder of his life. The stroke. He communicated, but he just couldn't speak. In November of 2018, a press release confirmed he had returned to Vietnam and would live his last days at the Tu Hue Temple which he did. He died January 22nd, 2022, at age 95. By 2019, Thai and his community had built a network of monasteries, retreat centers in a number of different countries, including France, the United States, Australia, Thailand. Those in the U.S. include Blue Cliff Monastery in Pine Bush, New York, the Community of Mindful Living in Berkeley, and Deer Park Monastery in nearby Escondido, down near San Diego. Chris has uh, been there several times. Do you want to say any, make a comment about this place, Chris? Um, well, it's a, a lovely retreat area. It's in the mountains, and that kind of gold <clears throat> dome that you see there is the <clears throat> excuse me <clears throat> major meditation center <clears throat> and it's um, it's on the lower level and then you um, climb up and then the middle level is where the um, food is served and then the top level is where the monastics live and also um, residencies for well you know, for um, visitors that see. Um, probably in the fall. In the fall. Okay. Yeah, it's a, it's a lovely spot, beautiful spot. Um, he published over 130 books. Now, most of them are small, and I think Chris has 128 of them. <laughs> <laughs> but um, he, yeah, he, he wrote. He was, uh, he was always writing including more than 100 in English. So he's written 100 small volumes in English, uh, which have sold over 5 million copies worldwide. His books, which cover topics including spiritual guides and Buddhist texts, teachings on mindfulness, poetry, story collections, essays on Zen practice, been translated into over 40 languages. Three of my favorites are Peace, if you ever want to read any of these, they're very short. Peace is Every Step, No Death, No Fear, and No Mud, No Lotus. 
No mud, no lotus. Have you ever seen lotus, beautiful lotus? They grow out of mud. So you see, you see, we all have our mud, <laughs> but we all have our lotus. And in a way, you don't get your lotus unless you got your mud. So it's that notion of continual spiritual advancement. Um, in terms of his teachings, let me just briefly say Let me just say a, a few things. Um, he combined a variety of teachings of early Buddhist schools and Zen Buddhism with ideas from Western psychology, that's bringing these two traditions together, to promote what he called the engaged Buddhism movement, emphasizing the individual's active role in creating change in their own life. In this regard, he rephrased what were known as the five precepts for lay Buddhists. Traditionally, these were given in thou shalt not, <laughs> sort of like do not do that. He made them positive. So instead of no killing, he said reverence for life. Instead of no stealing, into true happiness in generosity. <laughs> No sexual conduct into true love through responsibility. No lying into loving speech and deep listening. And no alcohol or drugs into nourishment and healing. So he wanted to get this positive notion. Have you ever found, if you say no, <laughs> tell somebody not to do something, there's often a reaction, okay? It's much better to, if you can rephrase it positively. He also emphasized what he called impermanence and interbeing. Remember the interbeing. That all phenomenal forms, it's all these individual forms we see around us, are both transient, that means they're always changing, yet interconnected. Okay. The rabbit, right? The magic show. Mm -hmm. Things go away. They only go away in form. The form goes away. According to the Buddhist teachings, the underlying Buddha nature which connects everything doesn't go away. Now, do you see what you're supposed to connect to? The Buddha nature. I mean, if you're connecting the things that you're always losing, I think that's the recipe for suffering. So he really focuses on this, that impermanence isn't a bad thing. A lot of people you say it's impermanent. Oh no, you know, how do I hang on to it? Mm -hmm. I want to keep this forever. Well, that's <laughs> you're setting yourself up. So, but the positive is that everything's interconnected. So it's although you're giving up individual form, you're gaining something. I like to compare it to sort of like you have the Christ spirit within, if you want to use Christian terminology. That's the universal which we all share and which Paul refers to. That's what we should identify with. So this is done in Buddhist uh, language, Buddhist symbolism, Buddhist philosophy. Um, so the language of this universal spirituality is the same as the basic values, he says, expressed in all the religions. So he was an interfaith guy. He saw, he said, look at the teaching and then compare it. Don't look at just the symbols or the words. Look at the teaching. Is the teaching the same? Now, not all teachings and all religions are the same, but there are unified teachings. And he believed this is what we need to move to the next stage of world peace, if possible. He was also known for his involvement in interfaith dialogue, as I mentioned. According to Buddhism scholar Sally B. King, he was extremely skilled at expressing Buddhist teachings in the language of universal spirituality. That's what we've got to learn from my perspective how to do, to take our individual teachings from our traditions and learn how to express them in language that is universal, that allows us to incorporate rather than. So let me conclude uh, at least this uh, uh, Thich Nhat Hanh with this statement from Thomas Merton, the, the, the Trappist mystic. His ideas for peace, if applied, 
would build a monument to ecumenism, to world brotherhood. They are the bonds of a new solidarity, which is beginning to be evident on all five continents and which cuts across all political, religious, and cultural lines to unite young men and women in every country in something that is more concrete than an ideal and more alive than a program. So, um, and that was from Thomas Merton. Okay, let's move to His Holiness, as he is often called, the Dalai Lama. So in Buddhist countries, it has been widely believed for the last millennium that the Bodhisattva of compassion, Avalokiteshvara, has a special relationship with the people of Tibet. This is the tradition. And intervenes in their fate by incarnating as the Dalai Lama. So the Dalai Lama is traditionally seen to be an incarnation of this Bodhisattva of compassion. In the Mahayana religion, the Bodhisattvas are those individuals who have reached the point of nirvana, but say, no, I'm not going until you all come with me. So they stay, and then they, they don't stay physically, but they stay in a sort of a cosmic realm to, be, to help. Because the, Buddhist, the, the essential Buddhist idea is if not, if there's the image of the boat, and the boat's taking people across the river to salvation or to enlightenment. Not one person can be left behind. If one person is left behind, the Bodhisattva takes a vow, I will stay. I mean, in terms of religious vows, I mean, now, is that, is that possible? Of course not. It's an ideal, though. It's the same ideal of loving everyone, that God loves every. It's that ideal. And if you lose that, you lose something big. So. Um, this was part of the, the, the tradition. Uh, uh, so, so according to tradition, long ago, uh, the Bodhisattva had promised the Buddha to guide and defend the Tibetan people. There's Tibet. So in the late Middle Ages, this is going according to their mythology, the master plan to fulfill this promise was a stage-by-stage -stage development of what became known as the Dalai Lama theocracy, the incarnation of the Bodhisattva in the person of the Dalai Lama. First Dalai Lama, 1415, a man by the name of Gendrum Drup. Fourteenth Dalai Lama, which is the current Dalai Lama. So there's been 14 Dalai Lamas since the 15th century. The, uh, the uh, 14th Dalai Lama is named Tenzin Gyatso. That's his name. He was born in Lamho Thondop. I think I have that. Yeah, in, yes, in Qing Chai province. July 6, 1935, to a farming and horse trading family. Poor family. Didn't come from some aristocracy. When the 13th Dalai Lama died, this is the Dalai Lama before the current Dalai Lama, according to the tradition, a search party is sent out to find his reincarnation. So when a Dalai Lama dies, they have a number of processes that they go through. They then send out a search party to find the reincarnation. After consulting oracles, the visitors of leading lamas, monks of high status, they found, there he is, there's the, da the current Dalai Lama, a two-year-old boy by the name of Lamo Thontro, who successfully passed all the tests. So you ask what the tests are. Well, 
One of the major tests is they'll take articles that belong to the Dalai Lama, another similar article that didn't belong to the Dalai Lama, put it down in front of the child and see which one he selects. Well, the, da the current Dalai Lama selected all eight objects that belonged to the former Dalai Lama. You can do with that as you wish. But that was sign enough with some other things that here was the reincarnation. Uh, so what happens at this point? He is taken uh, to Lhasa. Whenever they find a new Dalai Lama, they take him to the capital, uh, the center of what is Galupa Buddhism, this sect. And, uh, and he was ordained as the 14th Dalai Lama, being given the monastic name Tenzin Gyatso. Now, this starts a very long process of education. He was taken when he was three. But so he's gradually, but he will be, he will be educated up until college education. And he, constant education, yes. Did his parents have any connection with him after he was taken? Yeah, they come with him and they know him. It's a bit, oh, it's an odd. Can you imagine an honor? It's considered one of the highest honors to have your son taken as, 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 the, as the Dalai Lama. So he, uh, he began his monastic education at age six. And over the years, he studied five major and minor subjects. Major subjects, logic, fine arts, Sanskrit, grammar, and medicine and Buddhist philosophy, especially a, a form known as the middle way, which I'll have something to say about in a moment. Who is guiding the uh, church? They have, a, they're called lamas. Okay, and it's, it's like high ranking monks. And they act as? They act as, as his, uh, what, what's the term when you have before you become a? In, in politics, in, in political, anyway, and they educate him, and, um, and so, yeah, so he, he's, he's treated as a bodhisattva, because <laughs> that's what they believe he is. So at 23, he sat for his final examination at the Lhasa Jokong Temple, and he passed with honors and was awarded uh, the equivalent of a doctorate in Buddhist philosophy. And I will tell you, it's much more detailed than any doctorate in Buddhist philosophy you'd find in any Western university. And this is, if you've ever heard him speak, he is a very knowledgeable guy on top of lots of other stuff, but he knows he's, all right. so. He's now geared to become the next Dalai Lama. However, there's a problem brewing. With the uh, emergence of the People's Republic of China over mainland China after the Chinese Civil War, under the leadership of Mao Zedong, they claim Tibet is historically part of China. Now, there had been connections. There had been connections, especially during the Mongol period. But for centuries, Tibet had been pretty much uh, an independent country. Furthermore, it proclaimed an ideological motivation to liberate the Tibetans from a theocratic feudal system. And this is, this is a Marxist active revolutionary system who wants to change structure. And they saw, if you've ever seen the pictures of Lhasa and the big monasteries, they saw this is all medieval and blah. Uh, so in December of 49, there were talks between Tibet and China, uh, mediated by the governments of Britain and India. But China had other plans. October 7th, 1950, Chinese troops advanced into Eastern Tibet, crossing the border at five different places. 
Tibet, in the meantime, failed to secure foreign support. And the negotiations broke down. The major countries of the world don't want to go against China. <laughs> Tibet, we can sacrifice Tibet. Tibetan negotiators were sent to Beijing and presented with an already finished document, commonly referred to as the 17 point agreement. <laughs> An agreement that was handed to you. Do you agree? <laughs> if you don't, <laughs> there was no negotiation offered by the Chinese. All they did was guarantee religious freedom. <laughs> Tibet would have to agree to become part of China. Shortly afterwards, the People's Liberation Army entered Lhasa. That's the Chinese army. For several years, the Tibetan government maintained a certain degree of autonomy, but who's sitting right down the road? The Chinese army. And they were able to maintain some of the traditional social structure, the idea of the Dalai Lama, There he is in 1954. But in 1956, militias supported by the Chinese government started fighting against the Tibetan government in the name of land reform. <laughs> and when this fighting spread to Lhasa in March of 59, the Dalai Lama fled the city, disguised. And they walked. They walked from uh, Tibet to India. That's not like walking from here to Oxnard. Mm -hmm. um, with the permission of the Indian government, he and his followers were allowed to establish their community in a place called Dharamsala. It's up in, the, up in the foothills of the Himalayas. And that's where he resides still today. Um, he subsequently repudiated the 17 point agreement uh, and dissolved the Tibetan local government. In Dharamsala, he set up a government of Tibet in exile, which is often referred to as Little Lhasa. So after the founding of this government, he established the 80,000 Tibetan refugees who followed him into agricultural communities. So 80,000 refugees left Tibet to go down into India, to Dharamsala. He created a Tibetan educational system in order to teach the Tibetan children language, history, religion, culture of their country. Because if, you're, if you've left and you don't provide something, you're going to lose that. So he spent a great deal of effort doing that. He also established the Tibetan Institute of Performing Arts in 1959 and the Central Institute of Higher Tibetan Studies, which is, not in, which is in uh, Varanasi, uh, Benares in India. This became the university for Tibetans in India to, uh, to go to. In an attempt to preserve Tibetan Buddhist teachings and the Tibetan way of life, he supported the refounding of 200 monasteries and nunneries. So he's very anxious, you see, to keep the Tibetan culture, the tradition alive. Because he's not getting world support, government, world support from governments. He appealed to the United Nations for China to respect the rights of Tibetans. This eventually resulted in three resolutions adopted by the General Assembly in 59, 61, and 65, all before China became a member. Okay. 
Remember, uh, so they passed the resolutions, but China wasn't a member at the time. China then becomes a member of the, of the UN, and that's why everything towards Tibet is stalled. There will be nothing that gets through in terms of Tibet through the UN because China has a veto. It's one of those, yeah. Uh, in 1963, he promulgated a democratic constitution based on the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And he created a small parliament and an administration. Pretty small parliament. <laughs> In 1970, he opened the Library of Tibetan Works and Archives in Dharamsala, which houses over 80,000 manuscripts and important resources related to Tibetan history, politics, and culture. These were taken out when they left. They took a lot of these documents on horseback. Yeah, if, if you don't have your documents, you got nothing. Yeah, so you got to have those, yeah. Um, the same thing, they yeah. come out of China. That's right. It's considered one of the most important institutions of Tibetology, if you're interested in studying Tibet in the world. Um, now, unlike, this is what's interesting about this Dalai Lama. All the previous Dalai Lamas were more or less isolated in Tibet. They didn't meet with any world leaders. And it's interesting because the Dalai Lama always sees the positive. He's been asked many times about what this tragedy of being driven out of Tibet. And he says, yes, it was a tragedy, but it also opened up our connection with the world. So he would always, he always saw, saw the positive. Um, He's met with, and traveled around the world, the US, Western Europe, Asia, the Pacific. In 1973, he met with the late uh, Pope Paul VI at the Vatican. And during the 80s, he met with uh, Pope John Paul II four times. Regarding these meetings, he said, we live in a period of great crisis, a period of troubling world developments. It is not possible to find peace in the soul without security and harmony between people. For this reason, I look forward with faith and hope to my meeting with the Holy Father, to an exchange of ideas and feelings and to his suggestions, so as to open the door to a progressive pacification between people. The da traditional Dalai Lamas did usually not look to others for suggestions. This is a new Dalai Lama, a modern Dalai Lama. In 1981, he spoke in the inter at the Interfaith Service of the World Congress of Faiths. His talk focused on the commonality of faith, just like Thich Nhat Hanh, and the need for unity among different religions. He said, I always believe that it is much better to have a variety of religions, a variety of philosophies, rather than one single religion or philosophy. This is necessary because of the different mental dispositions of each human being. Each religion has certain unique ideas or techniques, and learning about them can only enrich one's own faith. He's currently a member of the Board of World Religious Leaders, participated in the third meeting of the Board of Religious Leaders in Amritsar, India. In 2010, he published a book with the Saudi Prince Ghazi bin Mohammed, not Saudi, of Jordan, <coughs> uh, entitled, as you can see, Common Ground Between Buddhism and Islam. And trying to bring together especially when Islam at, at this point in time was being given the name of this only violent. They, they, they wrote this book together. Um, 
And then, like I said, in 2014, he, went, he joined the Hin a Hindu Congress, a big meeting of Hindus. So he's met with the Pope. He's met with uh, Muslims. He's met with uh, Hindus. Uh, a focal point of his teachings, and I'll say a little bit about them, is, is known as Madhyamaka. Don't worry about the name. Um, it was created back in the uh, third century. It goes way back. Third century, this teacher by the name of Nagarjuna, uh, one of the famous Buddhist philosophers. Uh, it's the dominant interpretation of of the Tibetan Buddhism that he follows, and has also been very influential in Korea and Japan, influencing Zen Buddhism. According to this doctrine, now this will sound familiar, all phenomena are what? Transient, not only transient, empty. Empty. The various parts come together for a period of time, but you take them apart, what's left? It's empty. So everything is empty. Now, this frightens a lot of people. What do you mean I'm empty? Well, but the emptiness is what allows for change. If everything was solid and there was no emptiness, there would be no change. So it's that emptiness that allows for change and the change that then has the interconnection with all other things. Phenomena are what they call dependently co-arisen. Nothing arises independently. Everything arises in relationship to something else. Think of anything you do. Let's say you have a cup of tea in the morning. Where did that tea come from? somewhere else. Everything is connected. Nothing stands by itself. And once you have that view of things, that changes how you approach other things. Because you realize you're dependent on so many things. It, it'd be an interesting practice. Some, go, some night, go home and just write down all the things that you did today and the connections. You're going to be there a while. You're going to be there a while. So it's this notion of the universality, the unity, even though the individual parts are changing. And this applies to the self as well. We're made up of different parts. We're not the same. Are you the same when you were now than when you were five? Not even yesterday. Not even, yesterday. Not even a moment ago. If you're really, if you're looking at minuscule change. Everything is constantly changing. Everything is constantly changing, even ourselves. He had a lifelong interest in science and technology. Uh, when we went to hear him at the Universal Studios, some, I think Ron Honeycutt tells this story, someone asked him, what do you consider yourself? He said, a scientist. He said, a scientist. This began as a child. He said he was observing the moon through a little telescope that he had. And he realized it was a lump of rock. And it wasn't emitting its own light like Tibetan cosmology taught. The Tibetan tradition said the moon illuminates its own light. Well, he looked at it. And he said, uh-uh. And this is the Dalai Lama. So what he's saying, and he's often said, if you find something that doesn't fit scientifically, don't believe it. And this is the Dalai Lama, who has all these sort of folkish traditions as part of uh, his religion. So on his first trip to the West in 73, he visited Cambridge University and met with a very famous scientist by the name of David Bohm. As a result, he saw important ground between science and Buddhism. He thought they had the same approach in that they challenged dogma on the basis of evidence 
and analysis. You don't believe it just because it says so in the book. In this regard, he spends much time and resources investigating the interface between, he, he does this year round, between uh, Buddhism and science. Uh, and what is the, there's David Bohm, nuclear physicist, very famous a nuclear physicist. Do you remember uh, uh, last week, Tagore meeting with Einstein, the Dalai Lama, met with David Bohm, and they're actually publications, and they share common, common ground on so many things. Um, he's the co-founder of Mind and Life Institute, and, he's, um, and this is worldwide, meetings uh, all the time. In terms of medicine, this is interesting, he advocates a synthesis of Western and traditional Tibetan practices, as indicated by having practitioners from both. And there's my friend Barry. <laughs> there, there was anyone here when Barry visited years ago and gave a talk? Okay. He travels with the Dalai Lama. Barry once told me a story. He said, the Dalai Lama was going to South America and there was um, cholera. And he asked Barry, should I get vaccinated? Barry, because the Tibet, his traditionalists were saying no. Barry said, yes. <laughs> the Dalai Lama got vaccinated. Also, we think of, uh, of Buddhists as vegetarians. He's primarily a vegetarian, but he's not. If, if you need it for medical reasons, then you can eat meat. And he actually told Barry, Barry at one point got very thin. And he said, You're, you got, it got sick. Yeah, you got to start eating some meat. And he did. So the thing is, he's open. <laughs> he's not going to be stuck in some tradition. He has his basic principles and his philosophy, but he's open to change. Um, he places great emphasis on compassion because he's the bodhisattva of compassion, after all, <laughs> according to tradition. In his essay, The Ethic of Compassion, he expressed his belief that if we only reserve compassion for those we love, we are ignoring the responsibility of sharing empathy with those with whom we do not have relationships. Does that sound kind of familiar to something you've heard in the Gospels, maybe? Yeah, if you only love, the, yeah, yeah. Which bars us from truly cultivating love. If we only love those who love us, who can't do that? <laughs> he elaborates upon his idea by writing that although it takes time to develop a higher level of compassion, in time, empathy will become part of our life and promote our quality as humans and inner strength. But you got to practice it. You got to do it daily. Find some little thing daily, some act of empathy. And just do it. Just like when you go to the gym. You gotta you know, do it daily. Can you, can you read those, Chris? I can't read them. <clears throat> Left says, love and compassion are the true religions to me. But to develop this, we do not need to believe in any religion. <laughs> <laughs> love and compassion are necessities, not luxuries. Without them, humanity cannot survive. Uh, he uses a variety of meditation techniques, including what is known as emptiness meditation, where the mind is emptied of all thought. Not an easy thing to do. Anyone ever tried beginning meditation here? You say, you're supposed to silence and quiet the mind. What's the first thing the mind does? <laughs> yeah, there's a term for it. It's called monkey mind. It's always jumping around. But like anything else, you gotta, you gotta stick with it. Stick with it. And then you'll see that eventually, the mind has its own life and you can empty it and there's beneath that, 
There's that emptiness which we all share, which they call shunyata. You may want to say soul. I don't know what you want to call it, but it's not thought. It's not thought. He said, the aim of meditation is to maintain a very full state of alertness and mindfulness and then try to see the natural state of your consciousness. All human beings have an innate desire to overcome suffering, to find happiness. Training the mind to think differently through meditation is one important way to avoid suffering and be happy. It's a great book that he wrote together with uh, Desmond Tutu, The Book of Joy. And it's about happiness. Yeah? You can, they're on Netflix too? Yeah, yeah. They're, they're a kick together, aren't they? Yeah. Desmond Tutu, is, who's kind of out there, is, you know, had the Dalai Lama. He said, let's, let's dance. Yeah. So the Dalai Lama, being the nice guy that he is, said, <laughs> Uh, he frequently accepts requests from students to visit countries worldwide to give audiences. Has anyone ever been to uh, an audience? He, Chris has. It's, he's sometimes in Santa Barbara. And he, he was, um, he's not traveling quite as much these days, but he still travels. Uh, his public talks and teachings are webcast. You can find him on his... He's a modern... <laughs> Can you imagine the 13th Dalai Lama saying, do you know the future Dalai Lama is going to have a website? <laughs> What's a website? <laughs> He's also the author of numerous books, many of them on general Buddhist subjects. Of course, there's the Book of Joy. If you want to just have a good read, that's a great read. But also including books on very uh, specific... You can go from very general light reading to some very deep stuff, depending how, how you want to go with him. Uh, in September of 2011, he issued the following statement concerning his succession and reincarnation. This has become a major question. Will there be the next <coughs> Dalai Lama? One of the reasons being politically the Chinese already have someone in line. They've got their own Dalai Lama. Yeah. Which puts, so this is what he said. When I am about 90, <laughs> I will consult with the high lamas of the Tibetan Buddhist traditions, the Tibetan public, and other concerned people who follow Tibetan Buddhism and reevaluate whether the institution of the Dalai Lama should continue or not. On that basis, we will take a decision. If it is decided that the reincarnation of the Dalai Lama should continue and there is a need for a 15th Dalai Lama to be recognized, responsibility for doing so will primarily rest on the concerned officers of the Dalai Lama's trust. That's, they should consult the various heads of the, of the Tibetan Buddhist traditions and the reliable oath-bound Dharma protectors who are linked to the lineage of the Dalai Lama. They should seek advice and direction from these concerned beings and carry out the procedures of search and recognition in accordance with past tradition. I shall leave clear written instructions about this. Bear in mind that apart from the reincarnation recognized through such legitimate methods, no recognition or acceptance should be given to a candidate chosen for political ends by anyone, including those in the People's Republic of China. <laughs>